वेलकम टू लेक्चर 26 ऑफ फाइनेंशियल रिस्क मैनेजमेंट दिस लेक्चर वुड कवर द टॉपिक ऑफ बेजल अकॉर्ड टू सो बेजल टू वुड बी कवर्ड इन दिस लेक्चर मूविंग टूवर्ड्स द कॉन्टेंट्स we will explore what uh, basel 2 is and how it is different from basel 1 if you remember from previous lecture we explored the topic of uh, banking regulations and we saw what were the reasons that banking regulations uh, were important and then we discussed basel accord basel 1 specifically and we saw how to estimate the risk weighted average so risk weighted asset and then use that risk weighted asset <coughs> to calculate capital adequacy ratio in this video we are going to see how that is different in basel 2 then we are going to explore what are different pillars in uh, basel 2 so basically there are three pillars and we are going to explore them <coughs> in detail okay so uh, basel 2 was issued in 1999 um uh, and it's also called a revised capital framework basically there are three pillars of uh, basel 2 first one is the minimum capital requirement this is similar to the requirement given in basel 1 where we saw that there was a requirement of 8% uh, minimum capital requirement or capital adequacy ratio that a bank should maintain at least 8% of risk weighted assets uh, as its capital and then there was a discussion on what portion of that capital should be tier 1 and tier 2 so uh, we are going to see how that is different in basel 2 as compared to basel 1 there uh, the second pillar is supervisory role and it basically discusses the role of central bank of the country that regulates um the commercial banks and the lastly is market discipline which discusses the uh the idea of disclosing information to to general public so uh first one is minimum capital requirement and in basel 1 the minimum capital requirement was 8% of rwa but one thing that you would have noticed is that once when we are calculating rwa we just take into account the credit risk so whatever amount that we have landed or the the bonds that we have uh, purchased essentially that is a lending the bond is a debt instrument so we uh, we know there is some credit uh, th- there is some risk attached to those lendings and that is that the borrower might not repay us the principal amount or the interest amount so which is what we call the credit risk so in basel 1 we just took into account the credit risk but as the uh, that basel 1 was introduced in 1988 but after 1988 uh different banks were involved in other operations for example they were involved in derivatives they were purchasing stocks of other firms um so they they were involved in marketable securities trading in capital markets <coughs> so when they trade in capital markets they there would be an aspect of market risk so basel 1 didn't included market risk into account it just included credit risk into account and then there is an operational risk uh, the the risk of theft and etc <clears throat> so what difference is in basel 1 and basel 2 with regard to minimum capital requirement is that in basel 1 it just uh, accounted for credit risk it just took 
uh, it just kept the 8% minimum capital requirement for creditors. But in case of Basel 2, uh, it takes into account the creditors, the market risk and the operational risk. So we need to have a minimum of 8% for all these three types of risk. This is the one uh, aspect of minimum capital requirement that has uh, changed. There was one more thing that if you remember when we are discussing the pitfalls of or the issues of Basel 1, we discussed that uh, there was a standardized system and that standardized system uh, of credit rating didn't uh, took into account a different um, rating of the firm. So for example, if a company had a AAA rating, it would have uh, a same uh, risk of 100% um, as compared to a, a company that had a rating of, say for example, C. So the individual companies were not taken into account. The, in, the asset classes were taken into account. So corporate bonds were given 100% risk as compared to the uh, government bond had were given lesser risk weight. Uh, the, the the risk the, the the asset classes were divided into different risk uh, categories but the the participants the uh, the companies the firms were not divided so what basel 2 did is that it also divided the uh, the assets into different categories based on its ratings so for example if there is a bond of a corporation and that corporation would have a rating of triple one or two double a minus so within this range then that would be would have uh, a risk of 20 percent so if let's say a bank lended 100 million to a corporation or a bank bought a bond for worth 100 million from a corporation whose rating is triple a then instead of assigning 100 percent of this amount to risk weighted average asset we would rather assign just the 20 percent of this amount so uh, that means that a company that is uh, less riskier would have we would have to assign lesser capital for that specific company Similarly, if a company is in the credit rating of 100 A plus or to A minus, then that would have a risk of 50%. Uh, so if you remember, 100% was uh, given Basel 1. So this in this case, in Basel 2, it would be given to double uh, B plus or to double B minus uh, credit rating. And others might also have a, a higher than 100%. Uh, risk weight similarly countries bonds uh, do have a rating and uh, a country whose uh, rating is triple a to double a minus would have a zero percent risk uh, weight and uh, so on and so forth so the idea is that the risk classes are not just divided the asset classes are not just divided into different categories but the participant too are divided <coughs> So suppose that asset of a bank consists of 100 million of loan to corporation uh, rated A. So we have 100 million to corporation rated A. 10 million to government bonds rated triple A. And 50 million to residential mortgages. <coughs> so if we assign a category, then uh, the corporate bond was rated a so this would fall in this range so that means we would have to assign a 50 percent risk weight a government bond rated triple triple a would fall in this category so its risk would be zero and the residential mortgage um, would have a uh, a risk of that is defined previously which is 50 percent so this is how we would calculate the uh, total risk weighted average 50 percent of this 100 million zero percent of this 10 and 50 percent of this 50 uh, uh, residential mortgage <coughs> okay 
next uh, uh, the credit risk had been uh, accounted for now next idea is the market risk and market risk uh, is the uh, risk that is related to certain market factors the systematic risk so if the interest rate increases or decreases or the foreign exchange rate increases or decreases <coughs> that might pose market risk <coughs> so a financial instrument that exposes bank to market risk include trading book as well as off balance sheet items so here we have introduced two terminologies trading book and off balance sheet item first thing is that uh, a bank is exposed to market risk from both these uh, trading book items and of balance sheet item items so first what is trading book items these are items that a bank buy and sell directly to make profit so remember the the, the name gives the idea the trading book so for example the bank buy marketable securities uh, stocks uh, so uh, so so these uh, de derivatives or commodities they invest in commodities <clears throat> obviously they uh, they contain some kind of market risk the second is off balance sheet items off balance sheet items are the items that are not mentioned in the balance sheet uh, for uh, for example uh, if we discuss the letter of credit uh, uh, letter of credit then this letter of credit is not mentioned in balance sheet what is letter of credit for example uh, party a is involved in some import export business then uh, a bank a bank a might give guarantee uh, on the behalf of party a now obviously if this party a uh, wasn't able to fulfill its liabilities then bank a would uh, as a guarantor would have to fulfill them so although currently there is no liability on bank a <clears throat> but it might arise if if uh, if the condition is fulfilled so there are there are uh, ifs and buts in uh, in the off balance sheet items they they aren't currently a liability or asset of the bank uh, or 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 an institution or organization but they might become a liability or um, an asset uh, depending on the Uh, conditions if conditions are met they might become a liability <clears throat> so if this party a defaults then the the guarantor would have to pay so in this kind of cases these uh, uh, liabilities these uh, off balance sheet items are not mentioned in the balance sheet in asset or liability portion but they are mentioned in uh, notes of the uh, of the books right <clears throat> similarly there there is a term that is used contingent liability and contingent liability is of similar nature for example there is a lawsuit and uh, a firm might win the lawsuit the case or it might lose it if if it loses the case then they might have to pay a hefty uh, hefty amount of money and that uh, becomes a liability in that case so for example currently there was a case of g uh, dic if you if you have gone through uh, them in the, the news then that uh, case uh, which was won by the government and uh, lost by the companies then those companies would would have to pay the liability uh, to the government uh, some amount that becomes their liability so uh, so this kind of assets are not reported uh, or liabilities are not reported in the balance sheet they 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 are contingent liabilities they are off balance sheet items so the idea is that a market risk is not just related to trading book items uh, derivatives marketable securities foreign currencies commodities stocks or bonds but they are also related to off balance sheet items okay so market risk is the risk that the value of on and off balance sheet uh, by on and off we mean whether the item is mentioned on the balance sheet or not mentioned on the balance sheet uh, and uh, on and off uh, balance sheet positions of a financial institution will, will be adversely affected by movements in market rates or prices such as interest rate foreign exchange rates equity prices credit spread 
and or commodity prices resulting in loss to earning and capital the simple idea is it is the risk that the value of on and or off balance sheet would be affected by the movement in uh, some factor so that factor can be interest rate or exchange rate or equity prices or commodity prices that would generate a loss <clears throat> but uh, how do we measure this this market risk uh, for that we have a method which is called uh, var var or value at risk the simple idea of value at risk is that <clears throat> what value of the firm is at risk this is the simplistic idea how much amount given certain confidence or how much confident we are that a specific amount would be uh, loss or uh, in other words how much confident we are that our losses would not exceed a specific amount so for example after some calculations our we are turned out to be 1 million then this means that and if we uh, we took the confidence interval of 95 or confidence level of 95 then this simply means that we are 90 95% sure that yeah or there are 95% chances that our losses would not exceed 1 million it would be less than 1 million or remember we are 95% uh, confident what about the 5% so this means that there is a 5% chance that our losses might be 1 million or greater than that so this uh, this this amount is called var it is the amount that is at risk <clears throat> so we need to understand uh, how to identify value at risk uh, how to sorry estimate the value of uh, at risk and this is used as a measure of uh, market risk so uh, to ensure the adequate capital is there to cover losses about expected level financial institutions need to know a single number that summarizes the total risk in portfolio of a financial asset in simple words remember when we were discussing the strategies of risk management we said holding capital is one of the strategy now to hold this capital the firm need to know uh, only one i number and that number is var and this would give us this would tell them the total risk of the portfolio right and for this they would need to hold capital how much capital that is a different debate but the idea is that once they know what amount is at risk if you know that you are going to, the, the 1 million amount is at risk then you would try to hold some capital or uh, for to to uh, to absorb this uh, this loss or this risk value of uh, value at risk is such a measure which was pioneered by uh, jp morgan so jp morgan introduced uh, this idea of value at risk okay so further we would discuss uh, in detail the idea of value at risk and how to calculate it in our uh, next lecture